welcome and thank you for joining us tonight to celebrate 2020 International Day of the Tropics. My, day, my name is Professor Karen West and I'm the Dean of Research at James Cook University Singapore and it is my pleasure today to announce our panel of experts. But as always, first we have a little bit of housekeeping to do. So today's webinar will be recorded, first of all. Uh, you will be able to ask questions at any point during the webinar through the Q&A function. The Q&A will be addressed at the end of the presentations. If you have any technical issues, please use the chat button to communicate with the event organisers. A satisfaction poll and survey will appear at the end of the webinar. If you wouldn't mind staying connected to complete them, we would be very grateful. So uh, now I would like to introduce to you our panel of experts and our moderator for today's event. So our moderator today is Dr. Ben Smith. Dr. Smith is the Director of Innovations in Food and Chemical Safety Program, Singapore Agency for Science, Technology and Research, known as ASTAR. Dr. Smith is a risk assessor and toxicologist who has worked across industry, academia, government, and is a strong proponent of collaborative research and the importance of embedding safety across the entire food chain. Dr. Smith is particularly interested in the development of risk benefit frameworks and the integration of human relevant and socially responsible safety methodologies into the regulatory approval processes for new ingredients and novel foods. Our first speaker of the afternoon is Professor Andreas Lopada. Professor Lopada leads the Molecular Allergy Research Laboratory in the Australian Institute of Tropical Health and Medicine at James Cook University. The discovery and characterization of food and inhalant allergens is central to our understanding of the molecular mechanisms of allergic reactions. Andreas' research team uses cutting edge molecular and cellular approaches in characterizing the interactions of immunogenic proteins from different allergen sources and the human Im immune system, leading to allergic and inflammatory reactions. Dr. Lopardis is the Asia Pacific Regional Associate, Associate Editor for the World Allergy Association Journal and the Associate Edi Editor of Frontier Allergies. Our, spe our second speaker today is Dr. Anand and Apen. Dr. And Apen is a Singapore Immunology Network Fellow and Senior Research Scientist in the Biomedical Sciences Institute, ASTAR. Dr. Andy Apen focuses on identifying risk factors for allergies and inflammation. His lab in the Singapore Immunology Network at ASTAR Singapore aims to understand the mechanisms underlying common chronic allergies like allergic rhinitis, asthma and eczema in children. They use a systems immunology approach to identify biomarkers and drug candidates by integrating allergen exposure and infection to immune response through high dimensional omics approaches. More recently, their focus has expanded to discovering biomarkers for adult chronic conditions like chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps and aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease. Our final speaker of the event is Dr. Elizabeth Tam. Associate Professor in the Department of Pediatrics, Yu Lin School of Medicine, at the National University of Singapore, Consultant and Head of Division at the Allergy, Immunology and Rheumatology at Kutek Puat National University Children's Medical Institute in the National University Health System. Dr. Tam is the Principal Investigator at the Singapore Institute for Clinical Sciences at ASTAR, leading the child health domain in the gusto and espresso birth cohorts. Her research focuses on atopic dermatitis and food allergy in children and skin physiology and microbiome in these disorders. She is also Honorary Secretary of the Asia Pacific Academy of Pediatric Allergy, Respirology and, and Immunology. So as you can see, we're in very distinguished company. So without further ado, I would like to invite Professor Andreas Lopada to open with his presentation, Allergy and the Topics. Over to you, Professor Lopadas. Yep. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Karen. I hope you can all see my screen. Yeah, that's good. <clears throat> 
Uh, so I will introduce uh, our session today where we talk about allergies uh, in the tropics. I will give you a brief overview what we uh, know, uh, what's different and similar in the tropics as compared to other areas in the world. And subsequently, uh, we have other talkers uh, presentation talking about um, the different aspects of allergy in the tropics, particularly on mites, and we talk also the clinical aspects about allergy. So I'll just give you a, a brief overview and uh, let's get started. So what are the tropics? So I found this very nice picture because we all talk about tropics, but what does it actually mean? All these areas, what you see in red, and we are in a moment right here in the Singapore area, we know, yes, these are the tropics going all the way up to Vietnam and India and even northern part of Australia. But actually large portions, uh, portions of Africa, uh, Central and, and uh, Middle America are all part of the tropical regions. And while they, we don't share a lot of um, uh, uh, habits, languages and cultures in these different areas of the world, one thing we do share and these are the same climate conditions, mostly 28 plus minus degree over the year and the relative high humidity. When you look at this map right in the top in this green regions, when we look at allergy research 40, 50, even 60 years ago, everything started in these regions to identify what's an allergen and how to diagnose and manage allergy. All this started here in North America and, and, and North Europe, but now, being you now in the tropical areas, we know there's a lot of different uh, differences between allergies in the tropics uh, compared to other regions. So straightforward, I come with a couple of uh, bullet points to let you know what's really different. Yes, over the last 50 years, allergies is much more pronounced. We know much more about allergies. 40% of the world population already are uh, in tropical regions of the world living up to 10% of children, 4% of adults, and these numbers are increasing the whole time. Very important, over 60% of all children in the world living actually in tropical regions. So that's a very particular focus on this. And Elizabeth will talk about this uh, later, very uh, particular. Uh, tropical regions, allergies are very prevalent. So there was a lot of discussions 20 years ago, I remember when I started, this work uh, coming from Europe myself, discussion was always like tropical regions, a lot of parasite, hygiene hypothesis, allergies are very not really uh, dominant in, in these regions, which is absolutely false. It's a myth. The reality is allergies are as common in tropical regions, but focus often to different allergens. And these allergen diversity, particularly in the Asian Pacific region, we know are very different. And because we don't have any medical therapeutics in the moment available, for food allergies, but uh, partially to inhalant allergies, there's a lot of work to be done to diagnose and manage allergies as early as possible. So what, what type of allergies do we know? When we look at food, we know there are big differences between children and adults. For inhalant, we don't know so much differences, but of course, food ingestions in early childhood is different. And when you look here, milk, peanut and egg making up three quarters of all food allergies in children, these data are derived, of course, from Europe and North America. It is very different here in Asian countries and in other tropical regions. In adults, it seems to be shellfish allergy is the predominant food allergen. And I will show you just now some updates on this uh, topic. So how does an allergy happen? So I don't want to go into molecular and immunological details, but what you see here on the left side, sensitization to peanut or inhalant, and you will probably recognize this little animal that's a house mite. Allergic sensitization to inhalant and ingested food allergens always go by the same way. Uh, allergens get presented to a range of different cells in our immune system. We call them dendritic cells. They activate a cascade of under other cells and then at the end also involve so-called cytokines, interleukins, and they tell a different class of cells to make antibodies, very specific antibodies they're called IgE antibodies. They're specific to the allergen source where we are sensitized to. These antibodies load now themselves on different cell types. They're called mast cells or basophils. There are different cell types involved. But once this happened, this is basically the sensitization phase. And the allergic reaction phase is when we are exposed to these allergens again, 
via ingestion or inhalation, these cells degranulate. They release everything, the contents out of their cells, and these a bunch of chemicals causing a range of different symptoms, systemic or local clinical symptoms. And they can be uh, basically categorized into mild to moderate or anaphylactic reactions. Anaphylactic, you usually find food-related allergies, whereas mild to moderate, you find usually more in inhalant. So there are, of course, differences, but that's what we see in, in general in these classes. But how do you identify that you actually have an allergy? How do you do you diagnose this? And there are again two different categories we distinguish. One is the so-called in vivo testing and the other one is the in vitro testing. In vivo is basically history, skin pick testing, bronchial challenge or food challenge. And um, Elizabeth will talk much more about this uh, later in her later talk. Whereas the IgE quantification is something what you do in the lab when the blood samples get sent to a laboratory for testing. They test, do, does this individual have IgE antibodies to specific allergens? And if yes, what is the quantity? Because as higher this amount of IgE antibody is to these particular allergens, as more likely you have severe reaction. And this field is developing the whole time. There's a lot of new developments happening when it comes to the testing. And these are the typical test systems where uh, the amount and quality and quantity of Ig antibody is determined to inhalant or food that doesn't matter but these methods are developing the whole time and they're very much dependent on what allergens is involved and there's a lot of work done in different labs around the world to identify and isolate these allergens on a molecular level and the other test uh, the in, in vivo testing is the skin pick test done in a lot of countries also in Singapore and you will hear later more about this and there's a quick test and you can quickly identify if somebody is sensitized uh, or not. So when it comes to allergic reactions, you have sensitization, also hypersensitivity, and you have uh, reactions where the immune system is involved and other reactions, the so-called non-immunological reactions, where you have toxins involved in other components. This is often found in food, but also in inhalant uh, in some instances. But in food, we have a lot of reactions. They're called actually caused by toxins and not by allergens. And this is why we distinguish this from a true immunological allergic sensitization. So here's again this IgE antibody, which is uh, quantified and diagnosed in diagnostics. And these are the allergens. And the allergens are the ones we're discussing more also in detail now how different they are to allergens from uh, other parts of the world. So importantly also when it comes to uh, food allergens, we have three different classes. This is typical what we know by ingestion, you get sensitized, but now we know also there's a lot of cross-reactivity, clinical cross-reactivity between people being sensitized to pollen or inhalant, I will say, and uh, food. And some examples you might even heard about is uh, latex, and certain fruits, but also mites, house dust mites and tropical mites and different food allergens. So we talk about this just now in detail. So the allergen sources, what are they? These are the big eight, we call them. Uh, maybe 90% of all food allergic reactions in the world are related to these major food allergens. But of course, this uh, situation in the tropics is very different and very under investigated. So a few things we know quite well is that fish and shellfish are definitely much uh, more frequent allergic sensitizers in the tropical regions. And we know also milk, egg and peanuts, so the typical children allergies we know from European uh, and American countries are actually not so important. And again, Elizabeth will focus on this later on and tell you more about what we see here in Singapore in the, in the diagnostic setting. So besides food, inhalants very important, and we will talk more about the mites. Here, this is a nice example, a little carpet on these guys uh, crawling around everywhere where we are, we are exposed to these mites. And more recently, also we talk about cockroaches or particular insects in general. Cockroach is just a member of this whole family of insects and in how they are important now, not only as an inhalant, but also going back to a potential food source and how this implicates allergic reactions. So how do you analyze allergens? Complicated, so I'll show you only one slide, but basically it's a very uh, chemical approach where you isolate these proteins. And these technologies are increasing the whole time. They're getting more advanced, more high throughput, 
and we are able to identify very small amounts of allergens in food sources on allergen sources and it helps us to diagnose uh, allergy to food or inhalant very early and it helps the clinician to manage these allergies in, in patients much better. And what uh, the, uh, this also allows us to develop so-called component resolved diagnosis and this is basically identifying different allergen components in different allergen sources here symbolized with uh, a fruit, uh, pollen, and some uh, foods. But what you can see is some allergens seem to be very specific for certain food source or inhalant source, whereas other allergens are called cross-reactive allergen components, shown here in light blue. And these are so-called pen allergens. If you are sensitized to one of these allergens from some food source, there is a very high risk and chance that you're cross-reactive to other allergen sources which contain the identical component or very similar component. And I'll show you just now some uh, uh, nice ex examples of these. And what does it allow us to do at the end to give a, uh, a patient, an individual, like in these two children, a better diagnosis here? They are allergic, yes, but between mild and severe, and other uh, individuals are perhaps very severe allergic because they are sensitized to a very particular component of this allergen source, and they need much more uh, intensive treatment and management uh, for their allergies. So this is why molecular uh, component resolved diagnosis is important. So I give you a little overview about seafood allergy as an example, how one can analyze allergies to a particular allergen source in detail. And everything starts from very broad and goes down to very detailed. And this, uh, the same research is also happening in Singapore when it comes to mites. And uh, Arnon will talk uh, to you much more about uh, mites and also about the different aspects of mite allergy. So everything starts with the prevalence and population dynamics or population uh, identification to see uh, who is allergic to what particular allergen or seafood allergen in what regions. Allergy diagnostics, testing out skin pick test or IgE diagnostics in a range, in a particular when it comes to food, where do we find these allergens and what type of food sources? Because management means also avoiding uh, uh, exposure to this allergen. And in the case of food, expo uh, avoiding exposure means don't eat the food or processed food which might contain this allergen. Molecular uh, allergology, looking at the molecular level of these allergens and the components, uh, discover new allergens and at the end elucidate the cross-reactivity. And I'll show you particularly with seafood where we have done some uh, very detailed work. Seafood, we all know seafood, edible seafood, we know they are fish, but what we don't often don't know, they are categorized in two different groups. The one are the so-called bony fish, cod salmon, catfish. Uh, we know there are a lot of people allergic to this and we have done a large study with over 100 children with fish allergy. And by doing this, we found also out that cartilage fish like sharks and rays seem to be much, much less allergenic. And we're looking at the level now, why are they less allergenic and what's the reason for this? on the molecular level and how can this help us to diagnose better fish or uh, uh, cartilage fish allergy. On the other side, we have also anisarchus, which is a parasite which is found in fish, also cause, uh, often uh, causing allergic sensitization. Then we, on the right side, we have the so-called shellfish. Uh, when you come in a restaurant, you uh, order paella, a shellfish dish, and usually you have all of these components together a couple of crustaceans, a couple of mollusks, like mussels, snails, or squid. But when it comes to the uh, contents of allergens, the allergens within these two groups are actually very, very different. Who, however, who is very close related to the crustaceans which we are eating, and we are sensitized often to these uh, crustaceans, are also arthropods. And this includes insects and mites. And I will tell you just more how and why are they actually uh, similar linked up these allergies. And the molecule involved, and I'll show you there's a major one where a lot of work is done, not only by us, also a lot of other groups, is this long protein called tropomyosin. And tropomyosin is one major uh, protein you find in mussels, in mussels of crustaceans, mussels of shellfish, and a lot of other allergen sources. And why is it so colorful? Just to show you when you analyze a lot of tropomyosin from a lot of allergen sources, you will see that these light uh, colored regions 
are, are very variable. They're different between the different species. In other regions here in dark maroon, in red, there are certain regions which are very, very similar between all of these uh, different allergen sources. So, and the idea is if you make antibodies, IgE antibodies to allergen, like for example, this prawn, there is a certain likelihood that these antibodies recognize similar areas of this protein from other allergen sources and very close related are unfortunately these insects, cockroaches, but also dust mites. And Arne will talk, tell you much more about the mites and the prevalence of these allergies here in, in Singapore. So cross-reactivity can be explained with certain proteins and what do they cause is clinical cross-reactivity. In a recent study done in, in Australia, uh, in children, infants under the age of two years of uh, age, and they were all house dust mite allergic, we could see in this region, in this dark uh, dots uh, represent antibody binding, IgE antibody binding to special proteins or allergens. We could identify that 10% of these dust mite allergic infants had also cross-reactive clinical antibodies uh, against crustaceans. So 10% doesn't seem a lot, but if you have a high prevalence of mite allergy, 10% of these individuals are really at risk of when they get exposed to these crustaceans that they might get even severe and anaphylactic reaction. So we investigate this also further, but basically prawns, crabs, lobsters, all belonging to the crustaceans, and we looked at the obvious shellfish uh, cross-reactivity to the uh, oysters and other mollusks. But what about the insects? And there we found when you look at this particular tropomycin protein here from our shrimp, not only cross-reactivity to other shellfish, but also to mites. And this is the name of these allergens, they give a name to identify them. This is a mite and these are insects and cockroaches. So here we identified already in these children there is a 10% in some studies also done in Singapore up to 20 or 30% of dust mite allergic patients show cross reactivity to shellfish. But also insects are now much more in discussion in the last two or three years. And the reason for this is a lot of insects are not just inhaled allergen sources, but also ingestion. And on the left side, a cockroach-like uh, uh, insect eaten, and the other ones you probably know. And then we have on the top here also cricket proteins. These, these uh, insect-derived proteins are already everywhere available. Uh, this is an example from Australia, but everywhere in the world you can buy them already. And there's, of course, a high risk of cross-reactivity to these edible allergens. And while this is a possible solution for food uh, and feed security for the future, the allergenic proportion of these edible insects is still very less uh, investigated and we're looking also in our laboratory to identify the cross-reactive allergens between crickets, mealworm and shrimps. What is similar and what's different and how we can we prevent consumers of food to get unexpected allergic reactions. So it comes into the big question, is it a food allergy or is it an insect allergy or mite allergy? or how are they related? And this is a slide which I used already 20 years ago, and we are a lot further now uh, from our knowledge point of view, but when it comes to the diagnostic, there is still a long way to go to improve this. So we highlighted also uh, a lot of these studies in the Molecular Allergology User Guide. This is a large book, 300 pages, used in Europe for clinicians to identify what best molecule do I use for my diagnostics to identify a patient having an allergy or not. And we wrote a particular section on shellfish allergy and crustacean allergy, where we identified all of this, what we discussed just now. So what's the way forward to tackle food and inhalant allergy? There's a lot of different research opportunities in the clinic, in a laboratory, and it starts with food processing techniques and allergenicity, and of course, improved diagnostic approaches for patients mechanistic studies, and Arne will talk about this much more in detail, what's done, for example, in, in ASTAR, the research institute, looking at these mechanism and how can you use them basically to develop better immun uh, uh, immunotherapeutic approaches for particular allergies and particular cross-reactive allergies. To summarize again, populations are currently 40% already living in the tropics, and this number is increasing dramatically, 
So this is not a steady state and more and more allergy research will move from European countries where it's very well established into uh, more tropical regions. Our allergen sources are very, very diverse. For example, insects as an example I gave you and, and with uh, seafood, clinical cross-reactive allergens are very important to, to identify. What is the impact on parasites? There's a lot of great work done in, in Colombia and in South America on this link between allergy and parasites. Uh, risk factors for asthma doesn't include only pollen and molds, but also mites a lot. The definition of natural history and management of allergies are very different in the tropics as from European countries. So we are redefining our parameters and, and Elizabeth will tell you much more about this, how important this is. Food allergens very different, the needs for specific sensitive diagnostics and more awareness. This is, I think, one of the most important things we can all help raising awareness about allergies in the tropics. It is an issue and it has to be investigated further. And that's a couple of my research team and collaborators, uh, medical collaborators in Sydney. And these are different doctors and postdocs uh, working in my laboratory on these different uh, aspects of tropical allergies. Yeah, on this note, thanks very much. This is the end of my presentation part. Thank you, Andreas. Yeah. That was certainly, certainly very interesting. I, um, I took a little note to look up what a cricket protein bar looks like. I've never seen anything like that. And yeah. I think I, <laughs> I, can I don't know if I want it, but I, I'm certainly going to look for it. But, um, but thank you very much. That was, that was wonderful. Yeah. Thank um, you. So now we will uh, welcome our second speaker, Dr. Anand Andiappan, whose presentation is titled, don't sneeze at allergies. Over to you, Anand. Thanks, Karine. Uh, can everybody see my slides? Yep. Yeah. Yes, they're there. Okay, brilliant. So thanks, Andreas. That was a very broad overview and uh, very informative as well. Uh, thanks for hyping up the mites for me so that <laughs> audience are prepared that definitely there's going to be mites in my presentation. So if we were to look at... Uh, diseases in general. For the research purposes, we will call them phenotypes, which refer to observable uh, characteristics. I would like to prepare for you for the presentation three aspects. One is the clinical phenotype, immune phenotype, and the tissue phenotype. For example, if we take allergic disease, there are three types of allergic diseases which are common. Uh, we have allergic rhinitis, which is represented by sneezing, runny nose, asthma, mostly by wheezing, breathlessness, and eczema by itchy, flaky skin. But if you go a bit further, you can also look at the immune phenotype, which talks about the candidate genes or the cell subsets like eosinophils and basophils. But we also have to look at the tissue phenotype because that's actually where the actual symptoms occur. And uh, for allergies, there's actually a cross sensitization, although all of them are allergic. Having one uh, allergic disease increases your risk to other allergic diseases as well. And as you uh, probably know, Singapore is right on the equator. So we are pretty much a good candidate to talk about allergies in the tropics. And all these phenotypes that you're talking about will depend on which environment we are present in. So the data that I'm going to show in my presentation will be focusing on the Singapore environment. So this is my title, uh, Don't Sneeze at Allergies. I have quite a lot of puns in my talk, so uh, yeah, I would hope you bear with me. So this is what Andrea has mentioned about the skin prick test. It's a very common test. It just involves three steps. You drop an allergen on the skin, you cause a small prick, and then if you are positive, you will have two reactions. One is a wheel, which is the central bump, and a redness, which is around it. And if your measurement of both of these are more than three millimeter in diameter, we would be considered positive. So when we started the study, there was a lot of reports across the world from Iceland to Australia. But one thing you notice is that most of the studies were focusing on Western populations and Western countries. So when we wanted to study this, we look at a population of about 7,373, which is a reasonably high number. And we asked the first question, how common is allergen response in Singapore? And if you are ready for it, 
this is the prevalence, right? So let me go back. And this is the prevalence of house dust mite allergy. So this is 70%, which means more than two thirds of the population in Singapore have a allergic response as compared to something like Iceland, which has 25% and even uh, our neighbors, Australia, which is only about 40%. Even more surprisingly, in these Western populations, they need four different allergens to come up with these prevalences. In Singapore, all that you needed was one, and that was the house does mite allergen. And to make the story even more interesting, if you look at allergic patients in Singapore, 95% of them have a house does mite allergy, and only 5% of allergic patients in Singapore don't have a house does mite allergy. And this is quite interesting because most of the literature during the time talks about polysensitization or allergen sensitization to multiple allergen sources. So when we discovered this, we were quite surprised. And we wanted to ask the question, is this due to genes or is it due to the environment? Because most diseases are a combination of both. So what we had in our population where subjects were born in Singapore and those who were born in uh, China or Hong Kong but come to Singapore for studies, and most of these were collected at uh, NUS itself. So the first question we asked is, how prevalent is allergic rhinitis in Singapore? And as you can see here, the prevalence is about 40%. Again, it's not as high as the dust mite sensitization, but it's pretty high. But what was more surprising is when we looked at the Chinese who had come over to Singapore, you could see that within three years, they almost have less than 10% of rhinitis. Three to eight years, it increases slightly. But if you are here for more than eight years, your prevalence goes up to almost 25%. And this p-value shows that you have a statistical significance. To compound for it, we also saw the same trend that increasing prevalence of allergic airway diseases with more exposure to the Singapore environment. Although it's important to note that even though after eight years, the prevalence is not as high as the Singaporeans. And uh, asthma in generally in Singapore is childhood asthma. So most of our population we studied here were migrants more than 18 years of age. So it's important to note that uh, childhood asthma might not be captured well, but you can see that the rhinitis prevalence is quite high. Surprisingly, however, this house does mite prevalence doesn't translate into eczema. If you look at the number of years for presence in the Singapore environment to the eczema prevalence, it's actually not that different. So combining all of these three data sets, we can say that the house dust mite prevalence in Singapore makes it quite a mighty story because it's pretty much one allergen affecting most of the population to result in these two phenotypes. And recent data also shows us that the combined prevalence of rhinitis and asthma in children can be as high as 40 to 50% in the Singapore children population. So this is one of the things which we did is we also have awareness campaigns where we make stickers about allergen sources to help the children understand what is their cause of asthma or rhinitis. And this particular sticker is one of those uh, campaigns where we explain to the children what causes their allergies. So given this uh, environment, we kind of are at, a, are at a very smart position to understand how the immune system reacts to this environment. So your immune system is prepared for reacting to things like allergens, uh, parasites or even viruses now like what we are facing now. So what we wanted to ask is, is there a difference in the immune system between people who have allergic diseases and those who don't? So a bit of immunology. So antibodies like you would have heard for, for example, antibodies for COVID testing. These are specific proteins produced against specific allergens. In this case, those which are produced against allergens are called Ig antibodies. And these Ig antibodies bind to these basophils to have the, react, the cells active. And when they are exposed to the same allergen for a second time, this is what is called as cross-linking, but basically they activate the basophils and these basophils produce mediators called histamines, which cause the allergic diseases, mostly rhinitis and asthma. And that's why if you have a runny nose or if you have allergies, you usually take a antihistamine. And this antihistamine simply works by blocking the histamine receptor. But what happens is after some time, you're exposed to the allergen again, you start having symptoms again. So antihistamines don't cure the disease, they just suppress the symptoms.
So another way to look at uh, basal flow activity was how prevalent is it in the population? So we studied in a cohort of about 463 subjects. We took their blood and we measured this activity of basophils to produce these mediators. And in 90% of the people, the basophils were active, they were mediating and they were producing their symptoms. However, in 10% of the people, this activity was not present. And this is phenomenon is what we call as energy or inactivation. It's an abnormal immune response. And we call it abnormal because in 90% of the people, the normal response is to have a activity, whereas in 10% of the people, it is not activated. So the simple question we wanted to ask is, if allergic rhinitis is mediated by these mediators through the basophil function, if these basophils don't function, do these people who have these allergic basophils have le lesser risk? So we went back to the population and we looked at it. And what we found was in the 90% of the population who had normal basophils which were activated, nearly 53.2% of them have allergic rhinitis. Whereas in the 10% of the population who had these allergic basophils, you could see that only 23.7% of them had allergic rhinitis. And this is important to note because this risk for those who have these, what we call as allergic basophils, has a four times lower risk than people who have normal basophils. And remember, they are not under any treatment. This is just a naturally occurring phenomenon. So one thing that we are looking now is, is there a way to understand how these normal basophils can be made into energetic basophils? And if these energetic basophils can be therapeutically modulated, maybe we can reduce the risk of allergic rhinitis. And if we find a way to target this, this could be something we could help for people who have nasal allergies. So this was a recent report in Straits Times. So uh, as Andreas had mentioned, so this is what we're currently looking at. If we are constantly exposed to the allergen, is that a way for the immune system to train our immune cells to not have a hypersensitive reaction? In addition, we also need to know how immunotherapy works. So immunotherapy works best if you understand what's the allergen that the person is allergic to. So far, if you look at most of the allergen immunotherapy products, they are either a mixture or they are tablets which are for grass and other stuff, which as I showed, is not really very relevant for the tropical population. So what we are proposing is that we need to understand what's the right allergen for the right patient, and then immunotherapy can be done either through sublingual or subcutaneous. And hopefully if we find out what indicates positive outcome, either through basal function or otherwise, then we can predict success. And the more research we do in this case, we can understand better how immunotherapy can be targeted. And towards the end, I just want to talk about some children's study that we did recently. So this was a grant we received from the National Medical Research Council in Singapore to look at biomarkers for allergic rhinitis. So a biomarker is basically a quantitative measurement either in blood or in saliva, which can indicate disease. For example, if you have Hb1ac measured, that's an indication of diabetes. So can we come up with biomarkers between children who have rhinitis and children who don't have rhinitis? Obviously, you can see why this child is not very happy and this child is smiling quite a lot. So, but to do that, we needed to find out what happens in the tissue, also what happens in the blood. So we collected both nasal swabs. This was before the COVID time and as well as blood tissue as well. And then what we did is we used this uh, fluorescent separation. So this is a technology called flow cytometry, which is present in our institute. So every immune cell has a particular marker which can be activated through fluorescence. And by identifying the marker, we can identify the different immune subsets. And these immune subsets can then be processed through a technology called RNA sequencing, which basically measures how many copies of a particular gene you have in a particular cell type, right? So to cut a long story short, we found that there was this particular candidate gene which we are looking at, which is present in this cell type called eosinophils. Eosinophils are a biomarker for allergic diseases. So what we measured is in these children who had allergic rhinitis, you can see that the level of this IL-5 receptor alpha gene is much higher compared to children who don't have allergic rhinitis. I should note that the p-value here is not statistically significant. So we are trying to increase our sample size to get a 
significance as well. But most interestingly, we found that the same gene, which was different in the eosinophils in blood, which is an immune subset, was also different in the nasal cells. And uh, the red bars indicate children with allergic rhinitis, and the green bars indicate children without allergic rhinitis. And this is important because now we know that this particular gene, which is involved in rhinitis, is involved in the blood, but also involved in the nose. So to bring things together, remember I mentioned about the clinical phenotype, the immune phenotype, and the tissue phenotype. So this particular candidate gene, which we are looking at, just alpha receptor alpha, is higher in cases in the eosinophil subset in blood. It's higher in the cases in the nasal tissue. So the question is, could we block the alpha receptor alpha for a potential treatment? And to our advantage, there's already a particular antibody. This is a, what we call is a commercial antibody, which already blocks the receptor, which is alpha receptor alpha. So this is the candidate gene we have. So this is the ligand, this is the receptor. So what this particular antibody, which is commercially available currently for uh, asthma, it blocks the receptor so that the ligand cannot bind. And if this ligand cannot bind, all the downstream function cannot happen, which means the disease symptomology doesn't occur. But this has only been studied for asthma and it's not currently approved for allergic rhinitis. So this is something which we are testing in our lab now to see if we can repurpose this particular drug for allergic rhinitis. So in summary, what we are trying to do is we're trying to understand what we call as candidate genes, which are present in different cells to come up with a list of candidates, which we will call molecular candidates or gene candidates. And these could be functional in two ways. They can either help us to develop diagnostic tests or they can help us to identify new drug targets. And these are both important because if we find the right diagnostic test to find out which patient has which symptoms, we can help them to treat early, but also to identify them early. We need to identify new drug targets because like I said, most of the medication available for allergies now are mostly symptomatic. They only remove your symptoms and those are usually short-lived. But we want to develop drugs which are long-term and possibly with less side effects. So this is currently what we are doing to identify biomarkers either for diagnostic tests or new drug targets which can be therapeutically modulated. So uh, I would like to mention uh, people involved in the study. Olaf was from SIGN, was my supervisor. Uh, Dr. Wong was the clinician from NUH, uh, Eric from Sweden, and Fuktim from NUS as well. The clinical partners at NUH who have been involved in the pediatric study, and also the facility managers, as well as a platform course in SIGN and the lab folks as well. And last but not least, uh, all the funding agencies that were helpful in funding all the research that I just mentioned. So I would like to thank you for listening and show a picture of uh, what not Singapore. So if you're ever in Singapore, do let us know. We'd be happy to bring you around one not, which is one degree north of the equator. With that, I would like to end my presentation. Thank you very much, Anand. And from somebody that suffers from seasonal sinusitis, anything that you have in the pipeline, I am your champion. It was, it was ex ab exceptionally um, educational. So uh, thank you. So now on to our final speaker for the, for the event. It's Dr. Elizabeth Tam, who will present on East Meets West. Over to you, Dr. Tam. Thank you, Karen, for introducing me, and thank you to the James Cook University staff for inviting me to be a part of this webinar. So um, Anand has covered quite a bit on airway allergies and uh, laboratory diagnostics. So here I'm going to shift focus a little bit and talk about food allergy and anaphylaxis, comparing the East and the West. So this is an outline of my talk. I will be covering the link between eczema and food allergy, as well as food allergy diagnostics in the clinical setting, and looking at patterns of food allergy and how they differ between Asia, Singapore, and the West. And then finally, a little bit about uh, oral immunotherapy, which is an emerging novel therapeutic approach. So eczema is the first step in the, in the atopic march. And what I mean by this is that eczema is sometimes one of the first manifestations of the allergic 
um, disorders in the child. So it can start as early as the first few months of life. And this is often followed by food allergy in a, in a vast majority of them, especially those with more severe eczema. And then the airway allergies start a little bit later, such as allergic rhinitis and asthma as well. So I just wanted to share some clinical perspectives with you. And this is a scenario that I see very often in clinic. Um, an eight-month-old baby who's had, who's had severe eczema since he was two months of age. And then he presents at seven months of age with hives, angioedema, which is eye swelling or lip swelling and, and vomiting after eating eggs at seven months of age. And eczema and food allergy, this is just to illustrate that there's a very close link with this. And we think that this is through the epicutaneous allergen sensitization that occurs through the disrupted skin barrier. And this is particularly so in those with early onset eczema, such as in the first six months of life or those with more severe eczema. And food allergy in itself would trigger eczema flares in some of them, but just maybe about 10% of all eczema, and particularly in those uh, in which the eczema is more severe. So how do we diagnose a food allergy? So you must have heard um, this from Anand as well as Andreas earlier on, but usually it requires an allergy specialist consultation where we would take a full history about the suspected reaction, do a relevant physical examination to look at whether the child would have any other related atopic history, uh, physical uh, findings on the skin as well as in the airways. And we would perform a skin prick test. I think uh, Anand has explained this to you. And this is a schematic of how we would interpret it. This is the erythema, which is the whole red area, but we would look at the flare and the wheel. The wheel is a raised bump. And if uh, the wheel measures more than three millimeters, it is a positive test result. And in some cases, we would go on to do a serum specific IgE blood test. And in some cases, they may also require an oral food challenge, which I'll talk about in the subsequent slides. So unfortunately, there are many other unvalidated tests out there. So often we have patients coming to us with something like this, where it, they would show us a comprehensive panel of what looks like a food allergy test. But if we look more carefully, it's actually looking at IgG. And this actually does not test for food allergy. So a lot of patients will come with a whole list of positive tests for this and ask us, doctor, do we have to avoid all of these foods? And our answer is no, because um, the allergic antibody is not IgG, but it is IgE. So we have to be very careful about how we educate our patients on what is a proper test for diagnosis of food allergy. So I mentioned food challenges just now. So we usually conduct this in outpatient monitored facility within the hospital. And this is a picture of our day therapy center in the National University Hospital. So it's set up very much like an inpatient ward, but this is an outpatient facility. So we would have uh, medical personnel, emergency drugs, equipment on standby, as well as medications to address um, any allergic reactions that might happen during a food challenge. And this is overseen by an allergy specialist who has ordered the food challenge. And what we would do is that we would administer incremental doses of the food allergen at 15 to 20 minute intervals until the child is able to consume a full meal sized portion. And if there are any allergic uh, reactions that do happen, we would stop the challenge and then address the reaction straight away. So we will use a food challenge to diagnose or to exclude a true food allergy. So moving on to talk a little bit more about prevalence of food allergy worldwide. So this is a graph showing the food induced hospital anaphylaxis. Uh, admissions in Australia over one decade from 1994 to 2005. As you can see here, the rate of highest increase is the red line where you'd see it in the youngest age group from zero to four years of age. And indeed, in preschool children, food allergies are the biggest um, problem in the youngest of these children. So if you look at the Western populations, such as Australia, USA, and United Kingdom, the most prevalent allergies in these uh, countries are actually egg, milk, and peanut, so in various orders of importance. And if you compare this to Western, uh, the Western countries to the Asian countries, you see that there's a lot of diversity in the food allergen patterns in Asia. So Japan would mirror somewhat the West in which 
Milk as well as peanut play important roles, but wheat is an interesting allergen that is popping up in many of the Asian countries um, that we have seen recently. If you look at Thailand, cow's milk and eggs are also there as uh, per all other countries in preschoolers, but shrimp is actually one of the major allergens as well. And looking at Vietnam, it's even more interesting because the first two top allergens are actually fish and shellfish, and then milk is there, beef, uh, it's something that's quite unusual, but apparently it's very common in Vietnam. And you don't even see peanut or egg uh, showing up in, in the first uh, top four allergens in Vietnam at all. In Korea, we would see different food allergens uh, implicated in the different age groups. So much like the rest of the world, cow's milk and egg are in the very young infants and toddlers. But as they get older, we would see more of a predominance of walnut as well as buckwheat. And in adolescence, you'd see that wheat and buckwheat are actually the most important allergens and they don't even see much of shellfish allergy in this population. So I'd just like to share some uh, data from our gusto birth cohort in Singapore. So this is a graph showing the food allergy prevalence from birth to uh, four years of age in this graph. But we have uh, followed them up to at least nine years of age by now. Our top allergen is actually egg, and this is most prevalent in the early years. This is shown by the dark orange bars, and then cow's milk in the blue bars, and shellfish in the yellow bars, which you see a little bit off in the early years, but you see this starting to emerge from three years of age onwards. And this is a, uh, this is a follow-up study, which we have not published yet, but the preliminary data shows that once they have reached about five years of age, the dominant allergen is now shellfish, and we hardly see any more egg and milk allergies after this age. And as you can see from other studies um, in Asia, shellfish is actually one of the major allergens in adolescents and adults. So shellfish allergy is a big problem in Singapore and uh, a lot of times it's, um, it's complicated by risk-taking behavior because in Singapore, as we all know, it's a very, there's a very strong food culture here and lots of people are hesitant to eliminate shellfish from their diet because of all the good food that you can eat which involves shellfish. And then some people, despite knowing that they may be shellfish allergic or they have confirmed shellfish allergy, uh, may still continue to eat prawns and shellfish knowing or trying it out because they have perceived uh, that they have a level of tolerance to a certain amount before the reaction occurs. But because food allergy is unpredictable and your immune system might react differently from day to day, occasionally this may uh, turn out in this case like to be a fatal life-threatening reaction. So as I mentioned, persistent food allergy is a big problem and it causes significant impairment of quality of life. And in often uh, those with persistent food allergy, strict avoidance is the only way to go. So OIT or food oral immunotherapy is a new therapeutic approach that might give these patients some hope of being able to consume some amount of this allergen in their diets. So this refers to feeding an allergic individual an increasing amount of an allergen with the goal of increasing the threshold that triggers a reaction in these individuals. So this is a schematic of what an oral immunotherapy regimen would look like. So first there is an escalation phase that occurs early on right at the beginning. And this can be over hours or a couple of days depending on the institution's practice. And then this will be followed by a build-up phase where the patient will come back either every week or every two weeks to increase the dose of the allergen in a stepwise manner such as you would see here. And this will continue until they reach a maintenance phase where they, meet, they reach the maximum amount of the desired allergen and then um, without developing a, an allergic response. So when they have reached this phase, we would call them desensitized. And this can continue for months or years, but with continued ingestion of that allergen. So in some study protocols, for example, in research, um, there is a question about whether if the person or the patient stops taking that allergenic food, do they lose that ability to eat that allergen and do they become allergic all over again? And if they do pass this food challenge that happens after a period of avoidance, such as after 4 to 12 weeks, they will reach a state uh, which is called sustained unresponsiveness. But I'd like to highlight that desensitization and sustained unresponsiveness is not the same as tolerance. So what is the difference? 
So desensitization is a temporary state of clinical non-reactivity that will be dependent on persistent allergen exposure. So you have to continue taking the allergen in order to maintain this non-reactivity. However, tolerance in itself is actually a natural state of unresponsiveness that persists regardless of allergen exposure, which means that if, you're not, if you are taking the allergen on a regular basis or if you do not eat that allergen for years and years, you would still be able to consume it without developing a reaction when you next consume it. So in NUH, we have an oral immunotherapy uh, going for the past couple of years now, and these are the allergens that we offer. So peanut, tree nuts, uh, wheat, egg, and sesame. And we have successfully uh, completed about 60 to 70 uh, peanut oral immunotherapy um, protocols at this time, and the rest are still on follow-up. Just to share a little bit about our data and the experience that we've had for each of the allergens, this is the median starting dose of protein for most of them. And how we derive this is the baseline threshold that each patient comes in with. We start them with a baseline challenge to see at which level they would react at, and then we would start the oral immunotherapy on the step just before that. And then the median time to completion will be anything from 6 to 12 months, depending on which um, step of the protocol they began on. So just to give you a perspective, so one peanut or one egg, these are the amounts of protein that are contained in each of them. So one peanut would have 214 milligrams of protein and a full egg would be 6,000 milligrams and so on. So you will see that the starting doses for many of these allergens are only a fraction of this. So we actually have to start with, for example, a flour-based um, uh, components so that we can actually measure out the exact starting dose and the, con and the quantity of each one that will increase at each level. We have to be very precise and this is not something that can be done uh, out in the community by yourself because there will be no way of knowing the exact amount of protein and therefore controlling the amount of allergen that the subject is um, consuming and this might actually trigger allergic reactions if it's not done under careful allergy supervision. So here we are also engaging in uh, oral immunotherapy clinical research. So this is a collaboration with MCRI in Melbourne, where we are looking at oral immunotherapy to eggs for children and adults aged 50 to 30 years of age. So we are actively recruiting for this trial at the moment as well. So in the interest of time, I am just summarizing the research priorities now, but there are lots of interesting food allergy prevention, diagnostic and oral immunotherapy research that's going around uh, in all parts of the world. But this is just to highlight the differences between the East and the West, where in the West we would see, for example, the focus is very much on peanut, egg and cow's milk allergy. In the, in the West for food allergy prevention, there's been lots of um, interest around the LEAP and the EAT trials. And in Asia, we have done um, this egg allergy trial that was in Japan, which showed quite interesting results on baked egg um, um, consumption for the prevention of food allergy, for egg allergy. In terms of food allergy mechanisms and diagnostics, Andrea and uh, Anand have covered quite a bit of that. But in Asia, we see a lot of the focus is being um, put on the allergens that are unique in Asia, such as the wheat, shellfish, and some unique allergens that are not seen in other parts of the world, such as galacto-oligosaccharide allergy, which is a carbohydrate that is in a lot of uh, food and beverages, as well as bird's nest um, allergy. In terms of food immunotherapy, so by far peanut and egg, um, are one of the major allergens that uh, most centers have developed protocols for. But in the uh, Asian countries, we are focusing more and more on other, other allergens that are prevalent, such as wheat and even shellfish immunotherapy, which may be a thing of the future. So I'd just like to say thanks again to um, the NUH and NUS research team. So the uh, Pediatric Allergy, Immunology and Rheumatology Division, the laboratory team, as well as the research coordinators who have contributed a lot of, uh, to us understanding food allergy and allergic disorders in the birth cohorts, gasto and espresso. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Tam. And um, I, was, I was very interested in the differences between sensitization and tolerance. Uh, in what you presented, I thought that was, I've, I've never heard that before. So um, yeah, it was great. So I've been watching the questions roll in and they've had some very interesting and lots of questions um, now have come in. So I will hand over to our moderator, Dr. Ben Smith, who has been monitoring all of your questions and he will present them to our experts and
hopefully you will walk away with your questions answered. Over to you, Ben. Sure, and just to let everyone know that if your question doesn't get answered tonight, we've tried to um, collect them all and um, feel free to we'll, uh, try and get back to um, people on, on various questions. But a, lo a lot of interesting thought was stimulated from the present presenters. So first of all, let me um, thank everyone for their um, input and um, uh, for their presentations. One of the, I think, key uh, points that have come out with some of the questions here has um, very much been um, linked to this concept a little bit of you are what you eat. And a number of the questions um, have um, focused around these differences in allergens with respect to um, geographic region and also um, age. And in particular, um, uh, with questions uh, around the sort of concept of um, uh, why here in Singapore we're not seeing, for instance, um, large increases uh, or uh, similar rates of um, peanut allergy when um, where our consumption of peanuts doesn't really differ that greatly to some of the other countries where we are seeing um, um, allergies. And then also, um, why uh, different age groups particularly tend to be more, you tend to see certain allergens like egg and um, uh, egg and cow's milk being more prevalent and then um, growing out of those. And so I don't know if the um, uh, panel would like to comment a little bit on why they think um, there are some of these um, allergen differences uh, between um, the tropics and um, uh, Singapore, uh, sorry, between the tropics and, and some of these other areas. We touched on that they are, but um, any, any thoughts as to why? I don't know who wants to start. Andreas, maybe you can kick off. I'm mute first. Uh, well, I think it's also a very clinical question. I mean, uh, one thing is probably what, what we underestimate is the early childhood sensitization. And Elizabeth, you probably can talk much more about this, but I think the so-called allergic march, what we know from Europe, that children get at first food allergy, and, and we had this nice uh, picture on this, later on develop inhalant allergies, uh, it's quite different in, in tropical countries, including uh, Singapore. So maybe Arnon and uh, Elizabeth, you can maybe talk more about this really from the clinical practice, what you see here in Singapore. Uh, Liz, you can go first. Yeah, okay. So I think we do see a lot of cow's milk and egg aller allergy in early life, and we don't see a lot of peanut in Asia. So whether or not this is actually due to uh, dietary preferences is difficult to say. So for example, uh, data that we collected in the gastro cohort, um, although the, the current recommendations are that you should not delay introduction of allergenic foods, unfortunately, I think cultural practices are such that in a certain group, they are still delaying um, you know, introducing these. So it could be that you're not um, introducing them early and therefore they don't present in early life. But there's also another school of thought that says that perhaps in this population, there are some genetic and environmental influences that actually predispose us to not have peanut allergy, although there may be some uh, degree of exposure which may be similar to the, to the Western countries. But we don't know enough uh, in terms of research to understand why exactly there's this difference as well. Okay, so interesting. So maybe that's a, an area for the team um, to start looking at. Linked into that, a few people raised some different questions um, around the um, acceptability. But I think one of the interesting ones that did um, come out was with regard to this um, high aspect of inhalant um, allergens here in Singapore versus uh, some of the um, other countries. And um, one of the questions um, linked to that was around mold allergy and so and fungal allergens. And we're seeing a lot of um, increase in uh, a significant dust mite allergy and, and inhalation. But what about fungal allergy and particularly, um, and there was a lead on question to this as well, 
fungal allergy related to the skin, is there any link between fungal infections and, and fungal um, uh, de uh, dermat uh, dermatitis or derm dermatosis uh, reactions and um, inhalant um, allergy? Um, maybe Anna, you can comment a little bit on that. Yep. So it, it's quite interesting because uh, I didn't have time to show the entire data, but uh, the paper that we publish is online so people can have a look. So we actually screened for 12 common allergens uh, worldwide because we thought, okay, we're going to find a lot of allergies to a lot of allergens. At least when I started my PhD, that was a hope. But then we just kept screening and screening. So the second most frequent allergen sensitization is actually cockroach, which is about 10%. And the third is actually uh, uh, cat and dog. And only the fourth is mold. But if you look at the mold sensitization or fungal or mold, it's less than 2%. And it's quite surprising because in terms of exposure, I think most of us in the tropics know that because of the high humidity, it's perfect for both mold as well as dust mites. But somehow the sensitization or the immune response seems to be specific to the house dust mite. Mm. So slowly we are starting to see that there are these proteases, uh, which are allergen compounds in the dust mites, which have a peculiar way of activating the immune system but now we are also showing that these uh, proteases can even activate the skin as well as the gut. So actually the house dust mite allergy is not just an inhalant problem. Uh, mm. And I think this is an epidemic which is going to start very soon because if three fourths of your population is, uh, has an Ig antibodies against dust mites, it means that like Andrea has helpfully mentioned, cross reactivity, but also cross immune reactivity might become a problem as well. Mm. And on the particular, Particularly in the fungal question, actually, uh, fungal bronchiectasis as well as fungal uh, skin conditions are quite common in Singapore. So again, not to 70% 70 pre 70 prevalence, but they are not that uncommon. So actually, there seems to be an acute uh, problem when it comes to fungi, whether in the lungs or in the skin. But when it comes to chronic exposure, for at this point in time, uh, we only see the dust mite as a problem. But uh, also, you have to understand that the environment has not changed uh, in the last the 20, uh, changed a lot in the last 20 years, which means the immune system is still adapting. And this is where uh, what Elizabeth mentioned is very important that we don't have a tolerance yet. We still have a sensitization, but the problem could be that over time, we might get tolerized to the house dust mite, but we might start getting sensitized to other allergens. And this is something which as epidemiologists, we need to be looking out for. And also lastly, the house dust mite cross reactivity to shellfish is also a, something we have to look at. And actually, Elizabeth might have something to add on on, on that aspect. Yeah. I mean, that's an interesting perspective. And I actually wonder whether or not um, the difference in prevalence between mole and uh, house dust mite sensitization is actually a function of environmental exposure. Because in Singapore, I think we are rapidly modernizing. There are hardly any you know, old estates anymore. All the old estates are being torn down to make way for new housing estates. So in fact, when I asked my patients, um, is your house quite an old one or is it a new one? And they will all say, oh, it's built in the last five years or 10 years and there's no mold at all. So maybe that's because in the last maybe 10 or 20 years, um, you know, housing development has been such that there's very little mold exposure, but, you know, dust mite is ubiquitous in Asia. We can't get rid of it no matter what we do. So maybe that's why there's a skewing from mold uh, and, and fungal allergies over to dust mite, you know, in this coming day and age. And it is interesting because um, my Andreas might be able to shed more light on this cross-reactivity between the mite and crustaceans. And that we have a theory that this is possibly why we see so much of shellfish allergy in the tropics because there's just so much house dust mite. And they share that common tropomyosin um, structure. Yeah, yeah. so that's, that's really uh, absolutely right. Uh, uh, what you say, Elizabeth. Tropomyosin, what I showed you in some of the slides earlier on, is definitely one of the major protein where we know a lot of information but it's most probably, as Arnold said, much more complex, unfortunately. So that's one example where we have a lot of molecular data there. And we are actually busy now working with some companies where we can improve diagnostics and have a panel of these tropomyosins. And actually the research with Arnold in, in ASTAR, it's now happening where we can predict perhaps uh, potential cross-reactivity before a house mite or tropical mite allergic patient actually eats a shellfish and gets an anaphylactic reaction. Because unlike a true mite allergy, when it uh, turns into kind of food allergy, there is a high risk of anaphylaxis and death 
uh, which you heard earlier on with the leather best. And we have a lot of cases similar like this in, in Australia. People are not really aware a 20 year old eating prawns in a restaurant and one hour later they are, they are dead. So these things happening more and more worldwide also. And the recent study actually conducted in the US under adults showed that the major food allergy or the number one food allergen amongst adults is shellfish and particular prawns. So they found amongst I think 30,000 plus uh, participants that 10% of the adults were, had some type of food allergy. So much more than we previously uh, thought is actually also in adults. And maybe this is also changing environments, uh, different exposures, much more sensitization to invertebrates, what we call the mites and cockroaches. Mites we don't see because they're small, cockroaches we don't see because they, they work in the night. And we are always exposed in tropical regions to cockroaches and it's completely under, -invest, uh, under investigated allergen causing asthma. Uh, that, that's one particular phenotype we see. But now with this increasing insect consumption worldwide, we probably will see more and more cases also as food allergic reactions to insects, which might be initiated actually initially by sensitization to mites. So it's, it's a very complex uh, scenario and we're actually just at the beginning of identifying clues where we have to go. So following up on that, um, Andreas, is, is, and on some of the questions, obviously here in Singapore, there's a lot of talk at the moment about the Singapore food story and meeting our 30 by 30 goals. And a big area, of course, is looking at alternative foods and, and future foods and alternative proteins. So, um, and of course, insect proteins is a big source there, but so are fungal proteins um, as sources of new foods and uh, new protein biomass. How can this understanding of um, allergy in the population and the current understanding of prevalence of specific allergens in the tropics, how can that help us in um, understanding the potential risk from a food safety perspective that we need to, to start investigating and, and, and how can we use this data more to help yeah. us um, in that area? Yeah, thanks Ben for the question. And there's actually ongoing research also now in Singapore and Australia happening exactly on this intersection between public health, food safety and clinical safety. And I mean, the fact is it's still, when you look at a large population, a very small percentage of people who might have cross-reactivity. I mean, the issue is rather, early management, early diagnostic, and have perhaps even predictive tools. And we're working with bioinformatic specialists together to using this diagnostic to predict who will have potentially food allergy and who definitely will not have food allergy. So that's, that's the first thing. The second one is also testing food products for potential allergens. So food processing is a very important part. And we know that food processing often decreases allergenicity of food. So even food sources like milk and, and peanut and even egg, you heard this baked egg, can be even used as a therapeutic tool once we know what happens on a molecular level and immunologically. If we can use certain pr food processes to reduce or eliminate insect-derived allergens, uh, then there's no uh, uh, problem eating more and more insect-based proteins in our food source. So the only thing I think is really from including clinicians and immunologists and public health specialists to tackle the problem before it gets a problem. As we know now with epidemics and um, other problems we have now worldwide, precaution is better than afterwards running once a problem is established. Great. Um, does anyone else want to comment on that? Because if not, I think it was a little bit of a segue also into diagnostics. And there's been a few questions around um, uh, diagnostics, um, but one of them um, that has come out uh, with regard to these various tests and things like the uh, prick tests is how can you actually distinguish truly um, an allergic response versus an irritant response? And leading on to that, there was a, a question that I think links in um, with regard to the reactions of the immune system and the sort of secondary or second wing of the immune system being inflammation, being similar to um, an allergic uh, response that is transient. Um, and um, uh, here you have this sort of transient um, off signals, um, so-called resolvins, which suppress inflammation. 
So the sort of first part of the question, I think, is, is how can you distinguish between allergens and irritants? And then with regard to uh, the similar sorts of processes, is there an off signal for allergies that might be administered to halt allergic responses and um, suppress symptoms? So I think I can answer the first part of that question on how in the clinical setting we distinguish between, uh, say, a true positive result and an irritant reaction. For I think skin prick tests are quite specific for an, um, to detect IgE-mediated reactions because it actually has to do with testing the exact uh, allergen extract and then lifting the epidermis. So we don't see allergic, uh, we don't see irritant reactions to skin prick tests. And actually there is a negative control that we do at the same time to compare. Whereas if uh, the, the person who asked the question is thinking about patch testing, then yes, uh, for patch testing, you may come across an irritant reaction. So in that case, we actually do use um, uh, controls such as a, another person who's not known to have an allergy to that particular allergen to test this substance on their skin as well, to make sure that this is not an irritation or uh, irritant concentration of the uh, allergen under test. So we do use alternative people as controls. Great. And does anyone want to comment on um, the concept of like uh, inflammation um, as similar to an allergic response that is transient? Yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah. So I think part of what I, as in, again, in the interest of time, I didn't go, but the basophil responses is not permanent as well. Actually, the basophil reactivity is quite transient. So the same people who had anergic basophils, uh, three months later, they could have active basophils. Six months later, they go back into a trans, uh, in transient energy as well. So actually, the immune system, like, uh, like David actually mentioned, is quite transient in nature. It's very rarely that there's, there's complete on and off, at least uh, from the immune cells. The trick is, however, what happens in the tissues. And only recently have we started looking at uh, tissue level inflammation. Uh, for example, in skin, it's called skin inflammation. If it's there's nasal inflammation as well. Previously, we thought it was just a, a blood immune cells which just move to the tissue. But slowly, we are starting to see that the blood is a good snapshot of what happens, what we call as a circulatory immune system. But what happens in the tissue quite often doesn't reflect what happens in the blood. So uh, again, we are pretty much not uh, very sure. In the skin, we've started to see that, that uh, uh, inflammation that we resolve results very well. For example, uh, the monoclonal antibodies now that are coming up uh, against uh, interleukins are actually quite effective that the whole tissue inflammation gets resolved. But for something like asthma, we see that it's actually mostly symptom recovery. It doesn't really cure the disease. And there, I think it's because of the allergen as well as infection interaction. For example, asthma, a viral trigger could be uh, resulting in asthma exacerbations. For uh, skin, it's similar as well. There's uh, Staph aureus and other pathogens, which can result in an outbreak of uh, acute symptoms. So, um, so in short, I would say that, yes, uh, there is a transient nature which we can uh, manipulate and uh, understand better. But for now, I think for airway diseases, it's pretty less explored. For skin, there's a bit more data. And most of the monoclonals currently are targeting this uh, ability to basically downregulate the immune system, but it, in some cases it might have uh, negative side effects as well because you don't want the inflammation to be turned off too often because there could be other opportunistic infections which also affect it. So it's a, a balance between balancing your immune system as well as controlling the symptoms. So it's going to, but I'm un, personally I don't think we can ever cure allergies. We can keep it under control. So once you have allergies, pretty much you need to learn to moderate them better. So uh, that leads to one of the very first questions from um, the um, audience of can you cure allergies and I think it links a little bit into this interesting um, observation that uh, for people like myself that have moved to Singapore I can guarantee that I'm still going to get more allergies. Um, if I move to other countries am I going to um, uh, have those allergies lessen? Am I going to potentially pick up alle other allergies? Can I cure myself of, of dust mite allergies by moving back to Australia? So um, there's a few people here that have asked, um, can you cure allergies? 
Uh, let's get go first. She's the clinician, so we'll start with her first. <laughs> okay, well, there's some good news and some bad news, okay? So, I, I guess the good news is that uh, some people can outgrow their allergies. So we see that in cow's milk and egg allergies, for example. So I, I saw some questions about uh, why is it that the prevalence of cow's milk and egg seems to go down, you know, uh, as the child grows older. That's because a lot of these children, up to 80% of them would outgrow their cow's milk and egg allergies naturally. And just this is the natural history of how these allergies go. We don't really know why also, but this is not the case for shellfish and peanut, where once you have the allergies, a lot of time, uh, a lot of the time they are lifelong and you don't outgrow them. And I think that once you have an established persistent allergy, unfortunately, even for dust mites, you don't outgrow these allergies. Um, and it's a function of exposure that would trigger allergic responses. So if you are allergic, but you never get exposed to the allergen, then you do not develop an allergic response. So that's what food allergy uh, management is primarily about. You don't eat the food, you avoid it and everything, and then you kind of have you know, a, a safe life that you can go through, but the quality of life may not be very good. And if you have uh, inhalant allergies, for example, if you move from uh, a place where there's much less, much higher prevalence of dust mites like Singapore to somewhere where the prevalence of dust mite exposure is much less, then you would have less problems. And conversely, if you're allergic to pollen, uh, but you live in Singapore where there's not much pollen, you have much less problems with your airway allergies. But uh, the only other way to address a Persistent allergy is immunotherapy. It tends to work more in airway allergies, but for uh, oral immunotherapy, that's only just emerging and it's not uh, fully recognized worldwide as being ready for clinical practice yet. Yeah. Great, thank you. Sorry, I'm skimming through. There's lots of questions popping up and um, uh, a lot of people um, coming in with um, different aspects on the questions that have already been asked. I think one that leads on a little bit to, to this with respect to the um, life stages and sensitive stages for, for particular allergens, um, a lot of the discussion in the, in the um, presentations was around childhood allergies. Um, but um, with allergic asthma, there's another... Um, uh, uh, time point sort of later in life where you tend to see um, cases of allergic asthma spike um, in and this even in individuals who were not previously sensitive. So are there, um, and I know Anan you were looking at uh, potential factors of what might make people more sensitive um, from an immunological perspective, is there something similar between um, old, uh, old and young um, uh, that could, could explain this? Yeah, so actually it's quite interesting because um, it, physiologically, uh, once you are between 40 to 50, there's a drop in lung function, which is quite stark. Uh, as in, there's, it's, it's almost a 30% reduction and it's more ex exaggerated in people who are smoking. So COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, is asthma-like, but asthma is actually reversible, whereas COPD is not reversible. So we've done some studies looking at inflammation in COPD is quite severe, whereas if you look at asthma in the same people who don't smoke, it's quite different in terms of the phenotypes as well. And with COVID, actually, we've, what we've noticed now is that actually people who had asthma and are taking steroids or corticosteroids for their asthma tend to have a lower prevalence for uh, COVID infections. Again, it's, it's purely epidemiological. We don't know exactly what's the cause and effect. So when it comes to uh, elderly who are not childhood asthmatic, it seems to be a different pathway. It has to, basically it's your lung function, your capacity to, to process uh, whatever inflammation in the lung. And the second thing is also infection as well. For example, uh, like I said, bronchiectasis is one asthma-like symptom as well. So there are multiple uh, asthma-like syndromes in adults. Uh, personally, I would say that it's not very well characterized as much as in the pediatric, but also the allergic prevalence of uh, asthma is much smaller as well. Again, uh, a list can add on, but uh, so what I would want to clarify is that when it comes to lung, lung inflammation in adults is a lot more complex than lung inflammation in children. Uh, Liz? Yeah, first I want to clarify that I'm a pediatrician. <laughs> So I may not have you know, that much exposure to uh, managing adult asthma, but I would say that, um, yes, I think there is this bimodal distribution, but in the 
adult asthma, although um, you still present with a similar kind of clinical phenotype, right? Wheezing when there's a viral infection, Anand is right. Sometimes these are not just allergic asthma. Some of it is actually occupational asthma or could be a, a spectrum of COPD. Uh, because a lot of adults would smoke. So it's very hard to distinguish whether this is truly allergic asthma, which means there is an allergen trigger. And usually they mean um, airway allergens like dust mites. Versus could there be something underlying, uh, for example, smoking or something which predisposes a person to having hypersensitive airways in the first place. So I think there is a little bit of, um, the lines are quite blurred in, in adult asthma. And, and also to add, uh, as in I think one of the questions was talking about uh, BMI and obesity as well. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the correlations we've seen both in children and in adults, that if you are obese, uh, you tend to have a higher risk for asthma in particular, which doesn't associate with rhinitis to a small extent with eczema, but the uh, uh, obesity in both children and adults are quite strongly correlated to asthma as a phenotype. So that's, so that's why I said the uh, asthmatic adult is a lot more difficult to treat even clinically. That, that's why a lot more severe asthmatics tend to be adults as well. Whereas in children, in most countries, if you have good health care, it's mostly mild to moderate. We don't have as much severe cases, but when it comes to adults, you see a lot more severe asthmatics. Either they don't know they have asthma or the asthma control and treatment is quite poor. So is that asthma though in, in the um, obese or higher weight population, is that more exercise induced asthma or um, uh, true allergic asthma? I think um, there's probably both. And um, actually research has shown that in obese people, there are metabolic disturbances on a metabolomics level that actually causes the uh, obese individuals to be in a pro-inflammatory state. So they have different kinds of cytokine activations because of these metabolic disturbances. And that's why it predisposes them to having a Th2 kind of skewed cytokine uh, milieu that predisposes them to having allergic disorders as a whole and not just asthma. There's eczema, there's obese, uh, there's allergic rhinitis and asthma as well. So, so linked to that question and, and to some of the questions that are coming up, um, is there a link between allergies and autoimmune, di uh, autoimmune diseases that are linked to food? So things like celiac disease. Uh, we have not seen that link directly because they are quite uh, different pathways. For example, the uh, celiac and non-immune, um, I mean, the non-allergic disorders are actually not through the Th2 pathway. They're more of through a Th1 pathway. So we don't see that much of an overlap. If anything, they may be just observational studies in some populations. Um, but the prevalence of celiac, for example, is very different in different populations. You see it more because of genetic um, predisposition in the Caucasian population, but not in Asians, for example. So it's very hard to say exactly whether there's any correlation. Yeah. Yeah. Just to add on, actually, the immune link between the two is even more surprising. So uh, if you look at the regulatory T cells, which are a kind of adaptive tolerant T cell, it actually works uh, as a risk for one and as a protection for the other. For example, in autoimmune conditions, you, you, you find the T-Rex seem to be the culprit causing the autoimmunity, whereas if it comes to allergies, the T-Rex actually help to resolve the inflammation from TH2. And currently we're actually working on a few genes where we've seen that the same genetic risk factor, uh, like what we call as a SNP or a mutation, the same which increases uh, a level of CTLA-4 uh, results in risk in one population which has autoimmunity, whereas protects against asthma in, this, in the same population. So this uh, immune regulation is what we need to investigate more because most of the studies uh, were genetic in nature where it's purely statistical association, which is great, but the problem is uh, diseases are very complex. So if you don't resolve the immune and the tissue level of uh, inflammation or immune component of the disease, you might just see statistical association. So I think at this level, just like Andreas mentioned, the molecular diagnosis for the allergen, you also need the molecular analysis for the immune cells as well. And that might be the clue why, for example, celiac disease is not probably as common in Singapore, but allergies are. But we don't have epidemiological studies which have done detailed surveys to find out is, is celiac disease even common or is it just not reported? Or is it because we don't eat as much of uh, the particular allergen itself? So that, I think that's a question which, like, like they said, allergy used to be a Western disease, 
30, 40 years ago, where, you know, whereas now we've shown that it doesn't matter where you are. As long as you have allergens, you will have sensitization. Whereas food, I think we are pretty, yeah. I think it's a very long way away. I think Andreas might have more information on yeah, this, I mean, the study, yeah. Well, Arne says it's absolutely right with the, with, the, with the proper diagnostics is really true. I mean, Elizabeth showed earlier data of wheat allergy, for example. So often from this uh, population-based studies, sometimes they're questionnaire-based, and often they don't use really molecular analysis. So wheat allergy could actually be gluten sensitivity. And, and gluten sensitivity or celiac disease is actually not an allergy, you know, because it doesn't involve IgE antibodies to a certain protein. So it gets quite complex, and, and I think there's a lot of underreporting. You're right, and and uh, and and part of the problem is that the diagnostics uh, were based single component or allergen source, and not only recently, the last four years, we have a lot of microarray platforms available where you test two or three hundred allergens in one go, without asking the patient, "Do you remember to what you have an allergy?" Because patients don't really know. And, and that's why the clinicians is like a, a Sherlock Holmes detective over months and years to identify what the cause is. It's very complex and often relies on the parent to remember what the child was exposed to. It puts another complex component in and then language and culture. So what is non-refutable is an IgE antibody in your blood level. <laughs> so that's, it's a very good. If you've got a positive match, it's 100%. Uh, if it's negative, there are other ways to confirm this. And skin pick test is another very important tool, which in the right component, in the right setting can work uh, fantastically. So, so, yeah. To link to that then, Andreas, and I know we're running out of time. So as, as a question then, I suppose then that, that goes a little bit to your, to your comments around class one and class two allergens mm. and the classification of digest digestomics so class one allergens not um being digested all that well and having um strong um potency versus those that can um react but in your opinion um these uh non-immunological how what how much of a role do you think these non-immunological effects have in um stimulating the potency of allergy um and how important are they uh, to be looking at in addition to the allergic IgE responses. Yeah, so basically some kind of adjuvant effect, uh, natural adjuvant effect. And that's only, I think we're really at the beginning of, of understanding this more uh, in detail. I mean, usually we, we distinguish uh, additives and toxins very different from allergens. So we try to group it nicely into different classes, but we realize on molecular level and in logical level, uh, when you look at different cells, T cells can have uh, an enhancing effect for allergies or reducing effect or to autoimmune diseases. And similar, you have all these it's different, 20 hours. Uh, these different components in food. So example, peanut. Peanuts roasting, we know one of the reasons we see in Western countries so much allergy is uh, that peanuts get roasted, uh, it enhances the flavor. And this is added to lots of different food components, even in pizza as a, a flavor enhancer rather than a food ingredient. And this probably is one of the reasons because it stabilizes the allergenic protein, this heating process. Whereas in Asia and a lot of Asian countries, we know peanuts are eaten raw or they're cooked raw and they're not roasted. This destroys a lot of allergens. A lot of allergens are eluded into the cooking water. And this might be also one of the reasons we don't see so much peanut allergy in Asian countries where peanuts are eaten more raw or the immune system of early children are exposed to these differently processed food uh, allergens and uh, the immune system doesn't recognize them later on as allergens anymore. So uh, the food processing part and how food is processed and delivered is very different like 20 years ago and it makes it from the food allergen point of view uh, really complex and in a moment food processing um, scientists don't uh, talk to clinician and in between are this kind of molecular immunologist like me uh, and probably it's also Arnen trying to bridge the link between what we see in a clinic and immunotherapy and diagnostics and on the allergen level. So, yeah, so that's, I don't know if you guys, Anna and Elizabeth can add something on the food component and enhancement. Yeah, I think actually there were some questions on the healthy eating as well. So 
Mm. There are studies in when I was in, in Sweden, Stockholm, they've shown in a birth cohort that actually fish consumption was a, a, a strong protective factor against a- asthma risk as well. Yes. And actually in asthmatics who consume uh, fish regularly, their lung function got better on mm. response to treatment compared to those who did. So just with normal food, it's just that we don't really think of food as an, an inhalant as a link, but yeah. then the immune system is not it's classifying one from the other, right? So I think you're totally right in saying that on one hand, the food is evolving. Like, I don't know how much of what we eat will be natural anymore, right? Yeah. So what is natural is subjective, but also the immune system takes a bit of time to adapt, one at the individual level. So I think that's why tolerance and sensitization is important, but also on a population level, that's, there seems to be a balance that once the population realizes this is the norm, there seems to be a top, like 10, 20% seem to have uh, symptoms. The rest are okay. So it seems similar with it. We've seen that with inhalant allergens. We've seen that with uh, eczema, but we haven't seen that with food. And I think that's why personally food allergy in Asia is still at its infancy. So in terms of the, la- the curve, we are still in the lag phase. So with more consumption, we will probably get out of the log phase and then we will plateau. Uh, but the problem is now food is not just what we eat, right? It's, it's, it's insects, mm. it's uh, alternate meat, yeah. and it could be pizzas, which I don't know, go under where. So. <laughs> yes, maybe I can just add that the food can also be actually medicine. I mean, and I'm not talking alternative medicine. We've done studies in South Africa amongst a working population, thousands of workers in seafood fish processing factories, and a lot of them also like 10 to 20 percent were sensitized to fish, but they didn't have clinical symptoms, no asthma, and we looked then in blood samples, omega-3 fatty acid contents, and they had very, very high levels of uh, fatty acids, omega-3 fatty acids, because they eat naturally a lot of seafood. So this mm-hmm. consumption uh, compensated actually positively to the asthmatic symptoms and was highly protective. So it can be a sensitizer, but also really as a medicine in case down-regulating actually symptoms. Yeah. Okay, so on that note, we've had quite a lot of discussion. Um, I'm mindful of the time, and I think we're getting towards the end of our um, uh, discussion period. So what I'd like to do is thank all of the speakers, thank everyone for their interesting questions um, and um, discussion. And I'd like to ask um, if we've if we just got everyone can hold on a little bit longer. Ask each um, speaker to give um, their sort of one line takeaway um, that they would like the uh, participants of this call to think about when um, considering um, allergy in the tropics. So Andres, do you wanna start? Yeah, so I I think what we should really consider allergy in the tropics, including or increasing the diagnostic profile. That's one one research we are doing, but I think it eliminates a lot of um, subjective types of analyzing, what Elizabeth mentioned, not using IgG antibody, uh, non-availability of skin pick test solutions, and also availability of uh, allergy uh, doctors. I mean, allergy specialists, even here in North Australia, absolutely rare. You have to fly a thousand kilometers to the next allergy specialist. So to help people living in the tropics, and I talk about Africa, Middle America and also here, large parts of Asia. Uh, uh, good diagnostics, early diagnostics, I think it's very important. Yeah, That's I think. My side. Yeah. I think for yeah. me, allergies are here to stay. I think the next level of uh, adaptation for humans is how do we balance what we eat, uh, what we inhale, and what we sense on the skin? Because I, the evolutionary adaptation is based on how we adapt. And personally, the immune system is quite crucial. So we need to spend more time understanding the immune system as well as its interaction with the allergen. So we should be locking ourselves away in our home more than the COVID-19 measures. Without, without the dust mite, if you can. <laughs> and the mold coming from the air conditioners. Um, Elizabeth. Okay, so I think my take-home message is that 
um, you know, food allergy and airway allergies are so different in different parts of the world. So no one size would fit all in terms of uh, prevention approaches or therapeutic approaches and even the focus of uh, research. So I think each country and each region really has to come together and um, decide and collaborate to be able to focus on what allergies are prevalent in that part of the world so that we can actually progress, you know, food allergy and airway allergy research in, in where it's needed most. Great. So I think um, on, on that note, I'm going to pass back to Professor West, um, who um, uh, is uh, going to say a few words. Um, but uh, thank you, everyone, for the questions. The questions here that are uh, here, we'll try and record and um, figure out ways where we can um, put some um, answers and posts up for, um, uh, for these questions for further feedback. But I know the panelists would be more than happy to have people uh, reach out to them and talk about allergies and talk about um, uh, research uh, in the field, collaborations and um, questions. So, um, Professor West, can I hand back to you? Thank you very much, Ben. Well, what an event. You know, you know it's gone well when we have to close down the questions because we've run out of time. <laughs> Um, I'd like to thank all of our experts for their presentations and to Ben as well for his moderation and, and question moderation. I think it's absolutely fair to say that we've all come away with more knowledge about allergies than what we started with. Um, and it's been truly an eye-opening learning experience. And I, I do hope that your questions have been answered tonight. To our attendees, thank you so much for your time and your support and your questions. These events are successful due to your patronage. And tonight we had just under 200 attendees from a number of countries. And the interaction has just been wonder wonderful. I've been watching the uh, questions pop up and I take my hat off to Ben for, <laughs> for managing them. They were coming in thick and fast. Uh, I, can, I can see that the uh, polls are up. So can I please ask the attendees that are still here to complete the satisfaction poll and survey um, that's flashed up on the screen, screen now before you leave. And it's just, we're about seven minutes over. So on behalf of the panelists and James Cook University Singapore and myself, I wish everybody an enjoyable evening and I hope you and your loved ones stay safe and healthy as our countries beginning, begin to open up uh, post COVID or towards the end, we hope, of COVID-19. Take care and thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone.